All right. So we've come uh, uh, to the second portion of Zechariah chapter six in our, our look at the parallels between the seals in Revelation and, and what's going on here in the book of Zechariah. We've seen the, the emblems of, of kingship in an anointing and a testimony. And then now the crowns that we are looking at tonight were, were the emblems uh, given to the king at his coronation from 2 Kings 11. And having completed our look at the anointing and at the testimony, we have now begun looking at the, the section on the crowning. From verses 9 through 15. So Zechariah 6, 9 through 15, and maybe we should just read it again, since we're just getting familiar with this passage, this portion of Zechariah. Um, anybody want to volunteer to do that for us? I'm always happy to read, but I am even more okay. happy when others read. Yes. I yes, I will. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Oh, I'm sorry. My phone is doing crazy things. Okay, here I go. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Take of them the captivity, even of Helday, Helday of Tobijah and Jedidiah which are come from Babylon, and come thou the same day, and go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. <clears throat> then take silver and gold, and make crowns, and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even, even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. And the counsel of peace shall be between them both. And the crown and the crowns shall be Helam. I'm sorry. And the crowns shall be to Helam, and to Tobijah, and to Jedidiah, and to Hen, the son of Zephaniah, for a, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. And they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. And this shall come to pass, if ye will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Amen. Thank you, brother. So, you see we have a, a beautiful passage here that we begin we've begun looking at, and last week we focused in on the idea that the witnesses who are called to bear witness to this crowning ceremony of the high priest, Joshua, who's called the branch, and we've, we've looked at some of the symbolism of the branch when we looked at Zechariah chapter 3, but that was, that was months ago at this point, so we're going to have to refresh our minds on the branch imagery and this so brother is, craig the branch christ has always been considered the branch okay yes we we connect christ with the branch we also specifically it's connected with uh, the tribe of judah and so it's connected with kingship specifically so christ in his role as king we see he's also going to in addition to having these crowns, he's going to sit and rule upon his throne. Also kingship imagery. Um, and there's, 
the building of the temple of the Lord. And we began looking at some of these ideas in our study last week. Um, and especially we looked at the idea of that the witnesses who were called to bear witness were from the captivity, were those who had been called out of captivity and were cooperating in the process of rebuilding the temple. And uh, that was a beautiful study. And we saw the, the parallels in type and anti-type with those who have been called out of captivity in Babylon. For them, it was literal Babylon. For us, it's spiritual Babylon. So it's sin. It's the sin, right? Or is it literal? Or is it being called out of Rome? Yes, it's a, it's a captive mindset that leads to sin, yes. I see. I... We're in slavery to sin, but it's really, it's our wrong mindset that leads us into that sin. And God wants to set us free from that wrong way of thinking. And then our behavior will come back into harmony with, with the principles of, uh, of his law and of his kingdom. That's really the process of what he's doing here. So uh, I thought tonight we could maybe focus in uh, or begin focusing in, we're gonna to have to have several studies on the idea of the crowns themselves. Since it's so central to the passage, uh, this idea that they're making crowns and they're placing them upon the head of Joshua, the high priest, who has these symbolic titles and will do these prophetic things. Um, so uh, understanding what this uh, word for crowns really means and, and how it's used in the scriptures and how we can understand what's going on here in this ceremony. So the word being used here for crowns, it's in verse 11, and it's also repeated in verse 14. It's the same word in both verses there. And it's the word, excuse me, atara, atara in Hebrew, Strong's 5850. The word is used 23 times in the scriptures. And unlike many words in Hebrew, which often have many different meanings depending on the context in which it's used. This word uh, is a very focused meaning. It just says crown. It's only ever translated as crown. Even though there are other words in the scriptures that are, you, even in the Hebrew scriptures that are used for, for the word crown, but this word is only used as the word crown, or it can, uh, it sa says, be seen as a wreath but in the sense of using a, a wreath as a crown. Um, and it's actually only translated in the King James, at least, as crown. Now, as we consider that, I want to look at how the word's used. Uh, but just before we go into that, uh, uh, in our introductory study, when we were doing an overview, Sister Sasha brought up the, the very good question about the high priest and how he had a, a miter upon his head. And uh, was that the same type crown as is being talked about here in Zechariah? Um, is it a crown of a priest or a crown of a king? And so we have this word atara is the word being used in Zechariah. Now, in the book of Exodus, chapter 29, just to kind of make this quick comparison, uh, Exodus chapter 29, verses 5 and 6, uh, maybe somebody can read that for us. And thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the beast breastplate and grid him the curious girdle of the ephod. And thou shalt put the, I don't, mitre upon mitre 
upon his head and put the holy crown upon the mitre. Amen. Thank you, sister. Mm -hmm. And actually, you see in verse 7, there is also an anointing. Interesting. So, But we see here very clearly, it's talking about Aaron. Aaron, the high priest. Aaron was not a king. He was never crowned as king, but here he is high priest. But interestingly, the high priest does have this mitre upon his head. And interestingly, the mitre itself has a holy crown placed upon the mitre. A slight detail that I don't know if I really noticed so clearly in my previous reading of this passage. So the mitre seems to be a foundation for the crown? Yeah, seemingly. And so, and there are two different words, actually. Interestingly, neither of them are the word that's used in the book of Zechariah. But let's look quickly. The word for mitre is mitznefeth. Mitznefeth seems to be how it's pronounced. And it's Strong's H4701. And we see here it's translated as mitre 11 times and diadem once. And it's Description is turban of the high priest. It's also described as a tiara or an official turban. And it says here of a king or priest. Diadem mitre. And it's a turban of linen. And you go deeper into the lexicon. So the idea of a turban is much more, it's not a it's not made out of this mitre portion, the foundation, uh, as Father David described it, um, is made out of cloth, of linen. It's not made out of metal, uh, like a typical crown, or even a wreath. It's not made out of, out of sticks or twigs or whatever that a wreath might be, or branches that a wreath might be made out of. Um, and this mitre. Would it be more see, regional because it's cloth or no? What's that? Would it be more regional because it's cloth or is it just one of those things? More regional? Yeah, because when you said, I was thinking Middle East when you said it was made of cloth. I was thinking like more of the Middle East, more Middle Eastern when you said that, that's all. Oh, no, I, I don't know. I, I think it's it's just a different use. It's a, a you know, we, we, we see people wear turbans today, in different religions, um, and they, they have this significance. Now, let's, let's see how it's used in the scriptures, I think is what's best. And it's used in Exodus 28 three times, in Exodus 29 once, Exodus 39 one, twice. And in all those instances, it's connected with the mitre of the high priest. It's specifically made of fine linen, it says. In Leviticus 8, which is actually the, the, uh, the coronation or installation ceremony, the inauguration ceremony of the high priest is found in Leviticus chapter 8. And it's, again, the mitre here is being used in connection with, with the high priest. In Leviticus 16, it's also used of the high priest and something that he had to be attired with on the Day of Atonement, in the Day of Atonement liturgy. Uh, so that's interesting. Brother Craig, maybe the mitre um, identifies who he is and the crown identifies the status. Well, that, that's an interesting thought. We, we can keep looking at it. I'm not sure. Um, I think we need to, to look at look at it a little bit more closely and see how they're used. But and uh, the the last time that that word is mitre is used is in is in Ezekiel 21. And here it says, "Remove the diadem, take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt." him that is low and abase him that is high. Interesting. So I believe this is we have the parable of the sword of the Lord. 
that the Lord is against the land of Israel is the context for all their sins. And then he has an instrument of his justice, the king of Babylon. And so when he's saying, remove the diadem, take off the crown, he's actually talking about taking it away from Israel, not the enemies of Israel. Like verse 27 of Ezekiel 21, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. So that's very interesting. Um, what's the word for crown there? Atara. And the word for crown there is the word that's in Zechariah. So it's saying remove the mitre and take off a crown, which is the crown used in, Jer in Zechariah. But back here in Exodus, I am where we had the high priest had to be attired with the mitre upon his head and the holy crown upon the mitre. The word for holy crown, there is a different word than in, in Zechariah. It's the word nazar which is translated 11 times as crown, but it's also translated 11 times as the word separation. And it's also translated twice as consecration and once as hair, as in a woman's hair, being her crown. And it's connected especially to the consecration and separation of a Nazarite. Jesus, of course, was a Nazarite. And it can be a crown as a sign of consecration. It can be the stones of a crown or a diadem. And it can, again, be a woman's hair. And it properly, this, this word, instead of just only meaning crown, can mean, is a word that really means something that's set apart. And it means a crown in the context that the, the crown sets you apart from everybody else. But it seems that the word that is used in Zechariah, atara, is really means only a crown, as in a crown that is worn by a king. So we'll, we'll look in detail at each one of these words as part of trying to understand what's going on here, because there's connections back and forth between them. Even though they're different words, they, we see that they have similar translations in English because they're related meanings. And the, the word for the crown, the holy crown that's upon the mitre of the high priest actually has an interesting connection back with some of the things that we've been studying. So we'll have to look at that. Tonight, I wanted to focus on this word atara, which is the one that's being used in Zechariah 6, verses 11 and 14. So the first time that this word is used in the scriptures is in 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. So why don't we turn there. And it's found in verse 30. Um, you see, it's an interesting context where this is found. Second Samuel chapter 12, where it's found, the chapter actually, it's actually verse 30 where the, this word is found, but the chapter begins with the story of where Nathan had to come and rebuke David for his sin with Bathsheba. And then the child uh, was lost and died and they mourned, and then the story of interesting Solomon's birth, who would be the son of David, who would become king, just like Christ is the son of David, who is the one, who is the true one becoming king. And then it gets to that there was war, specifically with the children of Ammon. The children of Ammon, who are 
descendants of Lot. It begins at verse 29 for context, and it says, And David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. And he took of their king's crown from off his head, the weight whereof was a talent of gold with the precious stones, and it was set on David's head. And he brought forth the spoil of the city in great abundance. You see here, the word for crown there is atara. And the word for king there is melech, which is the assuredly the word for king in, in Hebrew, melech. Whether it was the, could the crown have been taken off the mitre? Well, in this case, it, no, because this was just the king, the crown of a king from the, what was a, a pagan nation at this point, uh, the, the Ammonites, who were descendants of Lot, who practiced idolatry. And they, they wouldn't have had a mitre in the same way as a high priest mitre here that we've seen. So in this case, it's just this word atara is just being used. And atara again is not the it's not the word that was connected with the high priest's mitre. It was a different word. Here this king's okay. crown. So the first time that this word atara is used, it's the one it's the word in Zechariah 6 that were where the high priest is being Interestingly, the high priest is the one being crowned with this crown, Joshua. But it's a the word for crown is a word that's connected with a, a, with a king, not with a high priest. Um, but of course, we know Christ is both priest and king, and so it may the one way i'm thinking is that the mitre represents the priestly and the crown represents the kingly um though there was no connotation of the crown being kingly in in uh in, in connection with with aaron being high priest no one was thinking that aaron was also the king so, but he took of the king's crown from off his head and it was placed on David's head. So here's a crown that is taken from the enemy and it's placed on the head of David. Now, I wasn't going to look at it tonight, it's, but as part of the list of this word atara, one of the places where this word is used but it really ties in here. So I think we should bring it together here with what we're looking at um, is in Proverbs 12, four, Proverbs 12, four, it says a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. And she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. So here in the story of, of David with the Ammonites, as the crown that was on the head of the pagan king's head is taken and placed on David's head, it's as if the woman is being taken from the king, one king to the, to the true king. And the woman prophetically represents uh, Church. Church. So here God is taking people who have been under the dominion of the enemy, Satan, and they've been part of the synagogue of Satan, and Christ, in a great battle, gets the victory and brings back the captives, those captives who are bearing witness that he's the true king, and now the crown goes on his head because he's got his virtuous woman. He's transformed them because they've switched kingdoms. They've switched allegiance 
from the enemy to David, or the son of David in this case. So beautiful, beautiful imagery here of the crown, of the one who's bringing back the those who are lost and the fact that he's able to do it and to transform them and make them virtuous is what gives him the right to be the true king of course he he's also has a right to be the true king because of creation as a creator but then as also as the redeemer here here's a work of redemption that's happening here in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And the transfer of the crown symbolizing this work of redemption. And that's definitely something that was done by David as a king, not as a priest. This is not a priestly function that's happening here, this work of redemption. It's a kingly function. Um, the next time that that word is used, atara, in scripture, after 2 Samuel is in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, 1 Chronicles chapter 20, and it's, I believe, an account of, it's, it's the parallel account in Chronicles from what we just read in Samuel. So in verses 1 and 2, it says, And it came to pass that after the year was expired at the time that kings go out to battle, Joab led forth the power of the army and wasted the country of the children of Ammon. He came and besieged Rabbah, but David tarried at Jerusalem, and Joab smote Rabbah and destroyed it. And David took the crown of their king from off his head and found it to weigh a talent of gold and there were precious stones in it. And it was set upon David's head and he brought also exceeding much spoil out of the city. And you see that time that David tarried in Jerusalem and that was actually when the committed his sin with Bathsheba and that's why we had the story of Nathan in 2 Samuel. Brother Craig, um, when you said the precious stones, it, it came to my mind that um, God calls the redeemed his precious jewels. Amen. That's right. That's Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, where we have the messenger of the covenant coming and he's a refiner and purifier of silver to purify the sons of levi very interesting and to bring judgment and then at the end of the passage it talks about verse 17 and they shall be mine saith the lord of hosts in that day when i make up my jewels and i will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him Speaking of the redeemed, he speak, calls them his jewels. Right, that are on the crown, which, which symbolizes the king. That's right. That's right, because the king is the one who fights the battle for you and gets the victory. And if they're on the crown, so we're attached to him. We're connected with the crown. Because the crown is a representation of his virtuous woman, and each of the stones are making up his bride. The individuals, yes. Yes, that's right. And that will actually be literally true on Christ's crown. There'll be, uh, there'll be a stone in Christ's crown for every single one of us. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
So that's an interesting, so that's the, the same parallel passage. Now, the next time in scripture that the word is used is in the book of Esther. And this is very interesting. In the book of Esther. And it's found in, excuse me, it's found in chapter eight, Esther chapter eight. It's actually in verse 15, which is near the end of the passage. But of course, you know, reminding us of the, the story of Esther, where again we have a, 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 a woman who refuses to put on the royal attire and is rejected as queen. And then another woman who, who willingly puts on the king's attire and becomes the new queen, Esther, and who is welcomed into his presence and he stretches out the scepter to grant her mercy and grace. And this chapter eight is happening right after the banquet of Esther where Haman is exposed and he's actually hung on the gallows that he had made to destroy the Jews, or specifically for Mordecai. And in chapter eight here, Mordecai is promoted and the king takes off his ring, the signet ring, which gives this impression and makes the seal for the work of the sealing work here connected with Mordecai. And it's, they, make uh, uh, a decree that the Jews can avenge themselves and fight back. And the, this decree that reverses the death decree, there's been a death decree against the Jews, against God's people. All this is typological significance for us today in the time of a sealing work. And the king of kings is going to give a, by the way, Artaxerxes who makes this counter decree is Ahasuerus is referred to as a king of kings, I believe, at least refers to himself that way, um, where he's a type, makes a counter decree to reverse the decree to destroy the Jews. And it's sealed with the king's ring, the sealing work, that no man can reverse it. And it goes out, it's sent out by posts to all of the entire realm. That's the whole work of the seals and the work of the seals going forth and the trumpets going forth, and the plagues going forth. These three groups to the peoples, nations, and languages in every province. Very interesting. And it, gave a commandment that they could fight for themselves. And it tells us, you know, verse 14, we'll pick up for context. So the post that rode upon mules and camels went out being hasted and pressed on by the king's commandment and the decree was given at Shushan, the palace. And I think we talked recently, Shushan actually means lily. And the pillars of the temple were, had a, 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 almost like a crown at the top of them made of lilies. And that's where the, both the king and the priest were coronated or inaugurated at those two pillars, the pillars of Jacob and Boaz. And that's where the decree here in Esther goes forth. Very interesting. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white and with a great crown of gold and with a garment of fine linen and purple in the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. And the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And, the Jew, and in every province and in every city whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And 
many of the people of the land became Jews for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. So this has such beautiful typological significance. This is actually part of our Sabbath school lesson recently. That's what I was thinking. And here Mordecai goes out from the presence of the king. Here this coming out movement. Notice the movements coming out, just like we've been talking about the movement of Christ when he's coronated as king in the most holy place, then he has his movement out of the sanctuary. Now Mordecai is coming from the presence of the king. We've also talked a lot about this idea of coming into the presence of the king is, is, is this whole final coronation process is about coming into the presence of the king. That's bringing the Day of Atonement to completion. That's uh, Acts 3.19. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. That it's his presence being made manifest to every created being. That's what the second coming really is. It's him making his presence manifest to every one of his creatures on this earth especially on you know all the ones all of us who are in denial of that fact and here mordecai as his representative is coming forth from the presence of the king once we enter into the presence of the king then we can be sent out in royal apparel to be his witnesses and he has crowns of gold for us as we're kings and priests unto God. So this work of crowning Joshua as high priest is also connected with crowning his witnesses who are sent out from his presence. That will be the final, as the final message is going forth, he has witnesses that bring the message. So those are the preachers. Those are the ones who are out preaching, right? Well, it includes the preachers, but that's everybody. That's everybody who is redeemed. And, and, and everybody who's accepting him as their king and who's being transformed then becomes a, a, a priest and king under God and becomes a witness themselves. Their, their transformation is the witness. So it's not necessarily verbal. No. It will, it will assuredly include verbal things, and there are right verbal words that will go along with it. But it's the life transformation that's the witness. Right, in the reflecting of the king. It's, it's the reality. It's, it's not just words, it's reality that people are being transformed. They've taken that, those words to heart and been changed. From glory to glory. And we see that the decree goes forth and brings gladness and there's a uh, many people of the land became jews uh, and will will not many under the preaching of the third angel's message also become jews become true seventh-day adventists who accept christ as their king Not Seventh day Adventists just in the denominational sense, but in the true sense of the word. That true believers in all history have been Seventh day Adventists. They've honored the Seventh day and they've looked for the advent of their Lord, whether it was the first advent or the second advent. So here's a here's a transformation of the witnesses, and of course, we're we're going to look at the idea that the witnesses who are who have come out of captivity and are mentioned in verse ten, we see some of them have a name change when the names are repeated in verse fourteen. There's the transformation. There's that very transformation happening. Uh, 
turned you into a true witness, as we see here with Mordecai. In the book of Esther here, both Esther herself puts on the royal peril before she comes into the presence of the king. And now Mordecai here comes out of the presence of the king with the royal apparel. And he's given the great crown of gold. And of course, even all the colors here are beautifully significant. Um, okay, the next time that the word crown atara is used is in the book of Job, which is also very interesting. We've got a couple of instances, Job 19 and also Job 31. So let's start with Job 19. We see here Job in responding to his his friends who aren't very good friends. Are we not told at the time of the end that we will lose every earthly support? So Job Job's having an experience that that's our experience. Job being the first book written by Moses and is, of course, according to the principle that God tells the end from the beginning and as a chiastic mirror, the Job experience is the experience of those living in the end times in this very time of the second coronation of the king and the judgment of the living. And Job 19 starting at verse 6 for context it says now know that god hath overthrown me and hath compassed me with his net behold i cry out of wrong but i am not heard i cry aloud but there is no judgment he hath fenced up my way that i cannot pass and he hath set darkness in my paths he has stripped me of my glory and taken the crown from my head. He has destroyed me on every side, and I am gone, and mine hope hath he removed like a tree. He hath also kindled his wrath against me, and he hath counted me unto him as one of his enemies. His troops come together and raise up their way against me, and encamp round about my tabernacle. He hath put my brethren far from me, and mine acquaintance are verily estranged from me. My kinsfolk have failed, and my familiar friends have forgotten me. They that dwell in mine house and, in, and my maids count me for a stranger, and I am alien in their sight. I called my servant, and he gave me no answer. I entreated him with my mouth. My breath is strange to my wife, though I entreated for the children's sake of mine own body. And it goes on and on, and then verse 21, have pity on me, have pity on me, O ye my friends, for the hand of God hath touched me. Why do ye persecute me as God, and are not satisfied with my flesh? So here Job's having this incredible, desolating experience. Where the crown is taken from his head. And this desolating experience is what we're going to have to go through, too? Yes. When it comes time for the crowning of Joshua the high priest, this is going to be the experience. But before we get overwhelmed with despair, Job continues in verse 23. Before you continue, can I ask a question? Go ahead. It just it sounded like um, a different sort of crown than the other crowns. The crowns before seemed like actual metal crowns. This one seemed more like a spiritual crown. Or am I mistaken? Well, it did, but it was still the same word. But yes, 
Okay. He did seem to be using it metaphorically, at least. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's see what he means. So he, he t but he tells us here. He continues. It's important to remember what he says. Job, the one who's gone through this experience, has has inspired testimony for us in verse twenty three. Oh, that my words were not written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. See, they weren't written in Job's day. Well, Moses wrote them by inspiration later. Um, but so Job's prayer here is actually answered that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Remember, we saw standing is a function of kingship that the king stands up to rule with great dominion according to his will that's daniel 11 3. michael standing up the, he michael's the redeemer in the latter day upon the earth and though after my skin worms destroy this body yet in my flesh shall i see god whom i shall see for myself and my eyes shall behold and not another though my reins be consumed within me continues but you should say why persecute we him seeing the root of the matter is found in me be afraid of the sword for wrath bringeth the punishments of the sword that ye may know there is a judgment so here the context of what job is saying again is confirmed to be at the time when the redeemer michael is standing up in the latter days and it's a time of judgment actually the judgment of the living. And he's Job's redeemer. See, this experience that Job is having, it feels awful. Everything's falling apart. Actually, what I was talking about in my, my sermon on New Year's Eve. But those things aren't falling apart to destroy us. God is seeking to have everything that is, is separating between us and him to fall apart. And since almost everything in our, our existence is contaminated with sin and is separating from him, it seems like everything's falling apart. But that's actually God redeeming us. Job describes the experience as an experience of redemption. And about seeing God. When we see God the way he really is, then all of the false things that I'm holding on to fall apart. I see that they're, they're, they're not like the, the, the reality as it is in the one who is the author of reality. So here, this and you see a very interesting kingship connection here in Job 19 with the crown. It's the stripping away of our glory that the glory of God might be revealed. In fact, inspiration tells us that Sister White said, you know, when asked about the third angel's message, she said it was about the laying of the glory of man in the dust. So that sounds like pride and uh, self-image, like a false self-image. That's right. So Job, Job was a righteous man. He was living righteously. He was doing what's right. But he saw that all of his righteousness was filthy rags compared to the true one when he beheld, when he, he saw him. But none of the good things that we do are actually of ourselves, they're actually from him. We're stripped of our glory. And we see ourselves the way we really are. Uh, the same word is used in Job 31.
And in the context of Job 31, as Job asserts his integrity, See that, for instance, in verse six, very clearly, let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know mine integrity. And he asks all the, the if, if questions, if I've done this, then let that be upon me. If I've done that wrong, then let that wrong be upon me. And, but he's not done those things wrong. He's been, he's been doing what's right in the eyes of God. Um, you maybe pick it up in verse 33 for context as if I covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding mine iniquity in my bosom did I fear great multitude or did the contempt of families terrify me that I kept silence and went not out of the door or that one would hear me Oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that mine adversary had written a book. Surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. I would declare unto him the number of my steps as a prince would I go near unto him. If my land cry against me, or that the furrows likewise thereof complain. He goes on with the ifs. And interestingly, in verse 40, it says the words of Job are ended. This is Job's final word defense in his discussion with his friends. After this comes. God's answer through Elihu, who God does not rebuke, and then God himself answers Job after that, which was actually his prayer. We see Job says, oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me. And Job actually gets that prayer answered through both Elihu and from God directly. And receiving God's direct answer to understand these difficulties of the struggle of, over dominion and the change of crown from one kingdom to another is a crown that we can take as a crown, bind it as a crown to me. how God responds in our crisis to deliver us leads to us receiving a crown. By the way, the shoulder also is connected with the, the king's government. That's in Isaiah nine, that the government shall be upon his shoulder. but restoring God's governing power over me because of how he answers in the midst of my crisis. The time he's standing up to redeem. Um, I think that's maybe a good place to stop for tonight. Any last thoughts or questions or comments? Well, this certainly is, uh, it seems like there's just an endless um, typology and uh, there can be many, many studies on this. Praise God. I only wanted to say that uh, any kind of crown means the rulership uh, we need to keep it in mind yeah um, i either it is a high priest uh, crown it's rulership over salvation and uh, the king crowned its rulership over the universe hmm. so if we keep it in mind it will be really good 
uh, for understanding all the types here. Thank you. Amen. Praise God, sister. Well, here, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, being with us and guiding us in this study, Lord. Please help us continue to understand the significance of your crowning and what it means for us and how it fits in to the prophetic picture of Revelation and Zechariah. We need your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us in all, all these things, Lord, to protect us from every error and every deception and all fanaticism, and to give us clear and keen discernment, Lord, from your word that we might understand these things and be able to, to share them with others and be your witnesses and hasten your soon return as our prayer. May it be in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.